But a dual citizenship is sort of equal, equal, isn't it? Not, not so the life of a Christian. The Christian is quite, quite unique. You know, I've been in this country since 1970. So I've lived most of my life here. But if I were to go overseas anywhere and they would say, uh, um, you know, where are you from? What are you? I would have, I'd, I'd still be inclined to say I'm European. It won't leave you. Um, and when I came here, uh, I mean, I love the country. I think it's great, great country. You know, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm here. But, but I never regretted the choice. But there's always something dominant about what's inside you, how you grew up, and yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's good. Citizens of two countries. Paul said this. When he talked about citizenships, he said, for our citizenship is in heaven. So he's speaking to the living here on planet Earth and for himself as well, because he says, our citizen. He said, we actually are citizens of heaven. I really let it th sink that in. We are citizens of heaven. I think that's significant. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. So how are you going to go to there where your citizenship is? Well, you're not going to get there by yourself. They can't even get to Mars. So... I'm saying that the only way will be when Jesus takes us, isn't it? And what a wonderful home that will be, an incredible place, who will transform our lowly body. That means our, you know, our not perfect body that has only a certain use by date, hasn't it? That it may be confirmed to his glorious body, the one he was resurrected with, and he has now, according to the working by which he is able, to subdue all things to himself, you have to believe. And it impressed me of Menta. You have to believe he's coming back. You have to believe he can raise you from the dead. It's no problem. It is no problem to a God who can place a hundred billion stars in one galaxy and puts another hundred galaxies like that in place. It is no difficulty factor to God. He will do that. He will raise us and then we will go home. The worldview depends on this. The American Culture and Faith Institute, it's interesting, they did various surveys and the main thrust is this. It's an American one, but it would be not unlike, in fact, it would probably be a bit worse here. 10% of Americans hold a distinctly biblical worldview. Now, these are adults that can make up their mind, young adults 18 and onwards. That's only 10%. That is not a lot. 46% of nearly 100 billion adults, the United States again, claim to lead a Christian life. You can ask somebody, say, are you a Christian? Yeah. Do you live a Christian life? Yeah. Really? Think about it. Seven out of ten Americans, that is actually just over 70%, call themselves Christian. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Now, the next question is, what is a Christian? Few were able to answer questions about the Bible and Christian beliefs. You talk to somebody who says, I am a Christian, then start asking them some very, nothing too difficult, nothing too hard. I don't know, just name the 12 apostles, there's a start. Won't do it this morning, but you know, I'm just saying. This is a reality. So, George Banner, who directed these studies, he said, our research collected information about attitudes, behavior related to, you know, daily practical matters. He said, like lying, like cheating, like stealing, like pornography, like the nature of God, and the consequences of unresolved sin. He said, they asked him about that. And, and, and the discrepancy between the percentage of people who consider themselves Christian, that is more than 7 out of 10, uh, and those who have a biblical worldview, the, the, one, you know, the 1 in 10, the 10%, he said it's incredible. This is what I'm trying to tell you. 
why is it so hard to get Christianity to the people? Do you understand? Why is it so hard for people to come and learn and listen? I'll do it by way of an illustration, and I hope it comes home. A ship in the water fulfills its purpose. Would you agree? It transports goods, it transports passengers, whatever you want it to do. It's functional. So a ship in the water is fine, but water in the ship is not. It defeats its purpose. So you can be a Christian and live it. That's good. But you take the world on board, what do you do? As far as your Christianity is concerned. It sinks, doesn't it? And people get the wrong idea of what Christianity is about because you just said you're a Christian. Get the picture? Do I? Yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. I think it's important. We value ourselves by and large by what we own and if you don't do it, anybody else will do it. Everybody else will. Now, God values you by whose you are. Who owns you? Not what you own, who owns you? And if it's him, up goes the value. It's not that he doesn't love you, but the value goes up. Because the price of Calvary is accounted to you. You know, again, uh, you see people, they live for years and years like us, and you think it never ends, and yet it does. Life is like walking a bridge at night time. You need light, so hopefully you have. And before you know it, when you start, it seems a long way. But when you finish, you're there. And the reality is this, that we're never ready for the end to come. And that applies to the end of your life too. It just presents itself, and there it is. I see so many people who still think at the old age, as if life here on earth will never end. Yes, it will. Quite soon, too. Sorry. Yeah? And it's good to know that, because where do you go from there? We need to think. If we have a background, if we have a innate, inside identity, and that normally is formed in the early years where you were raised and born, I'm sure, but I like to think that it is like that with you and God. Have a look at Noah. You know the story so well. We've spoken on Noah many times. Builds an ark. Massive structure. Massive undertaking. 120 years. Incredible. Just as well men were twice the size that they are now. 120 years. No one outside his family... By the time the flood came, no one outside his family believed it would be used to save humanity. They didn't believe it. What did they believe? He was a nutcase. To build that structure on dry land, away from water, we don't know how far, no flooding, no rain. How are you going to get the boat to the water? It's like you building an airplane, an airplane in a space this size. How are you going to get the airplane up? Do you understand? And it looked so stupid and everybody had a good laugh until, of course, all hell break loose and it began to rain and thunder. And the earth became to quaking away and it was incredible what happened. Paul in the letter to the Hebrews says this, By faith Noah, Noah means rest, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. He had never seen a flood, never seen rain, he never seen a storm. He, he would have to rely on God that he didn't have to take the boat to water, the water would come to the boat. And it did. He believed God. You understand? You gotta fully believe God. If you don't half, if you only believe him half half, you're still going to be lost. You gotta fully believe him. So being divinely word of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. There is his motivation. So the question is: what motivates you? Could be fear, 
But it's only good if it's godly fear. You understand? Godly fear as being in awe and respect of God. Prepared an ark for the saving of his household and it worked. And we're here because he built the ark. Are you with me? And so are the animals. They should be grateful too. I think of Abram's journey. What was the name of the place where he come from? Where did he come from? Anybody? Yeah? Where did he come from? Well, I didn't come from nowhere. Come on. I hear the name Ur. What area is it? What, where was it from? Very good. Ur of the Galdean. The Chaldean were the precursor to the Babylonians. They were more or less a mixed race. See? He came out of a Babylon. As a book of Revelation that calls people out of Babylon too. This is rather an interesting statement, an allegory. Abram came for, you know, you understand something. God's people, they either came out of Babylon or they come out of Egypt. But they have to come out. And the two stand for different issues in the life of a people. His journey, by faith, Abram obeyed. Again, this is Paul in the letter to the Hebrews. When he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. Now hold on for a minute. Abram, when he went to the place where God told him to go, had no idea what it looked like initially didn't know where it was, never read about it, never heard about it, seen nothing on television about it. He went there and he was told that it would be, that he would receive it as an inheritance. However, he never inherited it, but his posterity did. Do you understand? Conditionally, his posterity did. And so that's why the Bible puts it like that. And he went out, he went out, he left his comfort zone. Um, you come out of Babylon, you come out of Egypt. Either way, you come out of your comfort zone. Doesn't matter which way you look at it. Comfort zones can be very dear to us. Don't love them too much. It can be deadly. Not knowing where he was going, by faith he dwelt in the land as a promise in a foreign country, dwelling what? Now, he was a well-to-do man. He could have built himself an eight-bedroom mansion, no problem at all, swimming pool, double garage. No, triple garage. No problem. He had, he had the funding. But despite his wealth, he remained living in a tent because he couldn't own the land until the probation of the Emirates was finished. God told him. And so it, to live in a tent was an act of faith. Never owned any land other than the, the caves of Machpelah, which he bought. The heirs with him of the same promise. The same went for Isaac and Jacob. They never lived in houses. It's interesting when you read the Bible. When Isaac took over, there was, of course, one that was before him. What was his name? Ishmael. Ishmael built a house, but Isaac did not. And he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now this one, Abram offering Isaac. Anybody that has ever opened the Bible knows this story. It is the greatest story of faith ever, ever written down for your benefit. So Abram uh, offers Isaac. If you're Muslim, he offered Ishmael. And so by faith, Abram, when he was tested, was Abram tested, yes or no? Yeah. In the book Patriarchs and Prophets, when this was finished, there is a little note that she writes. She says, she says, and Satan was proven wrong. Like in the book of Job. Do you remember that? Why did God put him to the test? 
you can almost fill in the blank. Go to the first and second chapter of the book of Job. There was an accusation against God and an accusation against Abram by no less than Satan. On one of those meetings, there he challenged God and God allowed the challenge knowing, knowing that he would come through. So he says, no mortal man ever, what shall I say, rose serenely to the height as was attained by Abram. He offered up Isaac, of course, his hand was stayed because God called him out. And he who had received the promise that through Isaac, you know, should, you know, he waited for offspring for so long, God was testing him. He failed in Ishmael, he shouldn't have had a relationship with Hagar. He shouldn't have listened to his wife. <laughs> and, and, and so then he gets Isaac, and his whole life is bound up in Isaac, because in Isaac his posterity will continue, and then he's got to kill him. How are you going to maintain your belief that in Isaac your posterity will be blessed? It's an interesting statement that Paul uh, writes in Hebrew 11. He offered his only begotten son. It was remarkable. I still stand in awe of the man's obedience and willingness to do this. <coughs> he says in Hebrew, Paul, concluding that God was able to raise him up. He believed that if he killed him, and by the way, he was a lad of about 20, not 12 or whatever, he believed and spared a thought for Isaac for complying. Could have outrun his old man. He wasn't forced. He voluntarily went. A type of Christ, if you like. But this was illustrating what God had shared with his friend. Because the Bible calls him the friend of God. God shared with his friend what it is like to offer your son. You understand that. Very special relationship. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. He believed that. And he expressed that belief by willing to obey to the point that he would kill his only begotten son. Like the heavenly father did. And did do so by withdrawing from the son because that is what killed Jesus. It wasn't the cross, which it would have, but it was the retraction of the father's present. From which he had also received him in a figurative sense. So he was restored. Isaac was restored. Uh, and what happened after that? Does anybody remember that? Very significant of the story. In fact, it's probably one of the most important parts. What happened? The ram. The ram. What did the ram represent? Absolutely. A substitute. The Lord will provide the name of the mountain. The name of the mountain, uh, Yuvah Yareh, means just that. The Lord will provide. Yeah? And that also means actually Yareh, God's vision. The vision of God was that he would himself provide. The substitute for the punishment, which is what he did. Joseph. I love the story of Joseph. Hate to go through the experience. Mrs. Potiphar got him into trouble. Trouble that he was not looking for. At all. And that's what made her cranky. But ultimately, he there became the second. He liked the vice president, if you like. Like what Mike Pence is to Donald Trump. But I think his job is better. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, and he did do so at the age of 110, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. You know what was so significant on that? Whilst he had virtually the top job you could have after Pharaoh, in power, in everything, in luxury, you name it. It was nice when his brothers who sold him came in and they were all bowing down. I would have enjoyed it, but he didn't look at it that way. I could get used to that too, but he didn't, you see. 
And so, and so it was providential of God, but he made sure that one thing was understood by his posterity, his brothers and their children. This is not your home. Get it? And that is still of us as we are sitting here today. This is not your home. You're in trouble the moment you think it is. Yeah? You have a dual citizenship and the one in heaven is dominant. So he said, you make sure you take my bones back. Because he believed they would go back according to the promise of God. When Moses demanded the most powerful man on the earth, let his slaves go free, few thought it would ever happen. Who would have thought that, Fa that, that Pharaoh would give up his labor force who worked for very little? In fact, they worked for nothing. All you had to do was feed them, sort of. Amazing. Why even ask? Of course, it was God who was asking through Moses, but Pharaoh never believed it. What's fascinating, that Moses could have had his job. He was destined to be Pharaoh. He could have been sitting there. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was what? He was a Hebrew to him. Nothing ever would change it. In fact, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, that is the Hebrew people, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He had everything, everything and anything that you might have wished for in those days. But he didn't want it. There was something that was more precious to him. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of in Egypt, he remained loyal to God and therefore to his people. What a man. He looked to the reward. And this is the other thing. Like I said in the beginning, this life has a certain lifespan. It comes to an end. Before you know it, they tell me when you go over, get over 60, it goes very quick. And before you know it, you stand in front of the mirror and, yeah. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He had to run for his life, but he didn't fear the king. For the end he endured, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He looked to God. That is where he looked. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. Uh, you like this picture? Have a look. You're awake? Would you drive <laughs> with a car through two walls, through two walls of water? That takes faith too, doesn't it? So by faith he, he parted the waters, but if you were an Israelite doing walkies, and you have a wall there, and you have a wall there. Well, I'm just saying. It's challenging, isn't it? It would be. Joshua marching around Jericho. What's that going to do to the walls of Jericho? Well, I'll tell you what it did do when he did exactly when God told him how to do it. Uh, the walls, in fact, after circling it for seven days, the walls came down. David facing Goliath. I like some of the little pictures. Here's the stones. Can you see the stone? It's going to go right there between his eyes. Okay. It's amazing. L look what David said to, the, to King Saul before he got into this, uh, um, this skirmish. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David had a complete different worldview from his master King Saul. Completely different, completely different. Uh, he went on to say, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. So he was, he was a kid, but he was not a bad kid. He bumped off a lion and a bear to defend his flock. Do you understand? Now that takes a bit of oomph, yeah? So he was certainly not a pushover. Of course, compared to Goliath, he was 
a sitting duck. And so he says, he says, if God did it for me, he'll deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. That's faith, isn't it? What did you shy back off, of late or whenever? And you knew you had to do it. If God is going to be with you, who's going to be against you? And then, and then he said, you come with me to, to, to a message to Goliath before he passed on. <laughs> You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a devil, and he says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I love that. I love that. That's confidence, you see. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. I like, I, I, I love that attitude. And that must have made a powerful, and it did make a powerful impression. You know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're supposed to kneel down, and they didn't. And what did they say to King Nebuchadnezzar? Our God, whom we serve, remember that, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Because he had said, who is going to deliver you out of my hand? They said, well, our God can. And in fact, he'll do it. He will deliver us from your hand, O King. But look, if we're wrong, and he doesn't, if not... I like this message. Let it be known to you, O king. They were very polite. They said it very nicely, very nicely, uh, that we do not serve you gods, and we certainly won't uh, bow down to the golden image that you have set up. I like that. You know, these guys had courage. They were not there to offend, but they were there to lift the courage that God gave them. I like that. And if there was more of that, we would see an incredible harvest. Daniel in the lion's den. He shouldn't be there. And so the king said, King Darius said, oh, may God whom you serve continually, uh, you know, he will deliver you. But he still put him in the lion's den. Of course, he was too proud to let the law of the Medes and Persians be violated by having it altered. He got tricked. You remember the story there of Daniel chapter 6. To his credit, King Darius was awake all night and he came early in the morning. And of course, Daniel was there. And this is the reply of Daniel. My God has sent his angel, shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me. He said, they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before God. Here is something that you should know. If you are not innocent before God, you do not have the power. Adversely, you will not have the power. If there's a known issue between you and God, you mustn't assume his protection. He might give it, but there's a time limit. There is a probation. Daniel was absolutely right with God. So whether the lions would have had him for dinner or breakfast, he was not going to alter what brought him there. This is the faith that can be given to us from above. Do you understand? And we should acquire it. We should desire it. He said, I was innocent before him. And by the way, by the way, also you, king, you had no business putting me here because I did nothing wrong to you either. Now, we just studied the soul on the road of Damascus. What a magnificent story from a man of a persecutor who hated Christ Anything about Jesus of Nazareth, everything about his followers, wanting to kill and damage and brutalize, gets knocked off his high horse. God can do that. Lord, what will you have me to do? I love that. That's a journey, isn't it? He changed citizenships, you see. Suddenly he understood what he really was. And we'll study a lot more about him, of course. The island of Patmos. The island of Patmos was a prison from where you were not to come back. John, when he was exiled there, probably in 95 AD, uh, he would have and should have never come off that island, but he did. Because the succeeding emperor had a, uh, what shall I say, an amnesty for conscientious prisoners there. But traditionally, nobody got off the island of Patmos. When you were landed there, you died there and buried there. Well, it would seem that he was locked out from commun communication with the whole world. But he wrote that magnificent book that you and I know as the book of Revelation. 19, 
in 97, sorry, I'm 97, before 97 AD, he went back to his beloved Ephesus. And he would have taken with him the, the writings. And the book of Revelation is an absolute thrilling book, magnificent book, what we should study so well. And take Jesus, born in Bethlehem. Who would have thought, who would have thought that that little baby, 33 years later, would actually end up on the cross, crucified at Calvary, bearing the sin of the whole world? Yeah? This is directly for you and me here today. If that wouldn't have happened, we wouldn't be here. There'd be absolutely no purpose and the consequent resurrection. Paul, this is another very significant thing in Acts 16, which we'll probably study in a few weeks. He was working around the eastern side, and he was going to go due east. And then he had a vision of a Macedonian core. Now, that's very significant because that is Greece. And Greek thinking and culture was pervading the whole Mediterranean world. And he moved. He responded to the call. He thought he was going east. Now he was going west. And... and uh, and uh, received as a response to the Macedonian call. And that changed really the whole world. Because that brought Christianity into Europe, ultimately. You can see God's providence, a few people that I highly respect. The second president of the United States of America, far cry from the current one. I wish the current one would take a leaf out of his book. I must submit, John Adams said, the second president of the United States, I submit all my hopes and fears to an overruling providence in which, in which unfashionable as the faith may be. I, I like this. It may be unfashionable, but you better hang on to it. There's nothing better out there. He said, I firmly believe, I firmly believe. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a letter from Birmingham jail where, jail where he was uh, incarcerated because his uh, activities there, of course, of the civil rights movement. He said, one has not only a legal but also a moral responsibility to obey just laws. And he's right about that. There he was in jail. Why was he in jail? He did not obey the law. Why not? Conversely, he says, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws, and that's a very beautiful way of saying they were wrong. I like what John Stott said. He's an Anglican priest, he was, but he's very evangelical. He's an interesting person. Only died in 2011. We are able to submit right up to the point where obedience to the state would entail disobedience to God. Do you understand that sentence? Did you get that? Let me tell you how he qualifies that. But if the state commands what God permits or forbids what God commands, he says, then a plain Christian duty is to resist, not to submit, to disobey the state. So we can obey God. Does that ring a bell with you? It should particularly with us. The Bible says one day the state law will be against you. I wonder how many of us will hold on to the faith. But you need that faith to hold on to it. Rendering to Caesar that belongs to Caesar's, but most surely, most surely to God the things that are God's. Jesus said that. Here's an interesting story, Uzziah Henson. He was born into slavery there in the south, the deep south, and horribly treated by his owner. And in fact, he led his family on a harrowing journey to Canada, the northern continent there, because that is where freedom was. Led him to freedom. He founded a community for Africans in Canada. Notice, notice, a slave, born a slave, that provided homes, and let me put this as well, and livelihoods for thousands and helped to establish a school. Did you know on a, uh, on a, on a fundraising journey, he went to Europe and he had an audience with Queen Victoria? I bet you didn't. Well, she's dead. I mean, I know, I know. But how many of you have seen the Queen? I mean, would she let you in? A slave, mind you, a slave. Has an audience of Queen Victoria. Incredible. 
He also, he also had a, a personal meeting with the, the current president of the United States there, not this one. <laughs> uh, Rutherford Hayes was his name, was the current president at his days. In fact, there's something very interesting. He educated generations, and, and, and I want you to understand this. How many of you have ever heard of Uncle Tom's Cabin? How many? One, two. Blimey. That's an old-time classic about slavery. That book was very instrumental on the abolition of slavery, and he, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, was the author. He was the one who inspired her. She based the story partially on him and what he had to convey. I'm just saying this to me is fascinating. Our primary citizenship in this world, well, then our eyes, our minds, our hearts are mostly focused on worldly things. But when our primary citizen is in heaven, then our eyes, our minds, our hearts, mostly focused on spiritual things. Does that make sense to you? That will dominate your life. Set your mind on things above, not the things on earth, Paul says, for you die, that is the old self. And you, your life is now hidden with Christ with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In other words, you will be glorified. It's the only way to do it. It's the only way. I like him, always like Charles Persian, hard to be. By the way, that born slave also preached in the church of Charles Persian, he did. <laughs> Isn't it fascinating? What a career. Uh, if we know but little of the excellencies of Jesus, I, I like his language, uh, what he has done for us, note this, what he is doing now, he had a vision that God is, Jesus is still working for us now, and he is. We cannot love him much, that means if we know but little of the excellencies that he's doing for us. Do you get that? He goes on to say, but the more we know him, the more we shall love him. And Jesus did say, if you love me, you will do what? You'll keep my commandments. You don't love me, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. Not really. Not really. Doris Kumi was a young woman. She um, was only 30, I think it was. And she was advised that she had cancer and incurable disease. And she was given three, uh, three months. And the doctor said, you know, it's normally quite accurate. So she organized everything for, you know, her funeral and uh, put her house in order. She got the, uh, she got the, uh, the minister to come out. And she, she organized her, her own funeral service. You know, she, the, the, the hymns they would sing, the, 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 the texts that she would and who would speak. She organized it all. And so the minister was finished and then... And then he, um, he was going to leave. She said, oh, I'm sorry, Pastor, there's one more thing. There's one more thing. I forgot the fork. He said, what? He said, I forgot the fork. I said, what do you mean? She said, you know, my grandmother taught me, my grandmother taught me uh, that as we have, wherever you go, a banquet or, or, or dinner or what have you, uh, and you've had the main meal, Hang on to your fork. That's a good reason. Hang on to your fork. She says, she says, I won't because they, they would lay there in, you know, to be viewed and what have you. And the people would see her. And this was her message after she couldn't speak, of course. Keep your fork because the best is still to come. Don't you love that? What a way of making a point, yeah? You know, when that is your faith, and you happy to express it like that, by all means, hold a fork in your right hand. I like this hymn. I should have chosen it, but we probably haven't, but I love it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look into his wonderful face, because the earth, the things of earth will grow strangely dim. And, 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 you know, really, that is really the message in the light of his glory and grace. You know, you cannot compromise your primary citizenship, which is right there. Your name is already put down. Stay with it and live it. May God bless you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. 
that will be the sweet by and by. We thank you for the beautiful show that is before us. Help us to focus on that and let nothing else, nothing else detracts us. Nothing else is worse. The arrival of Jesus, the glorification, the journey home, walking through those gates, the streets of gold, and to see you and live. Nothing, nothing, nothing will compare with that. Keep us faithful. Keep us strong. Lord, we pray for that. We pray for the food, the fellowship that we're about to have. We pray for the afternoon services, Lord. Stay with us, please, through your spirit. In Jesus' precious name, amen.